Tony, where you're from? Jeff from Lexington, South Carolina. Ladies and gentlemen, let's give Jeff a hand. Of security jobs. I'm also not going to talk about 
uh, certifications that you need to get in order to unlock that next level. And I'm sure not going to talk about school. Here's what I'm going to talk about. I'm going to talk about these things that didn't progress across my slide. One more time. Not going to be this one, that one, or this one. <laughs> Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to talk about these things instead. I'm going to review my journey. I'm not narcissistic, though I totally love me. And I want to share that love with this room. Second, we're going to talk about the different tracks a security professional can take. And these aren't going to be the traditional tracks. These are going to be Adam's tracks. This is my opinion based on solid facts that I Googled until I found someone who agreed with me. <laughs> and then I'm going to call you to action to join a movement that's getting started right here at these sides that you've heard uh, already a few times today. So, enough about you. Let's talk about me. I graduated high school in Panama City Beach, Florida, and went to the University of Utah. Anyone uh, Utah people? Got one in the front? He's the coolest. Um, spent 96 credit hours where the downhill skiing, whitewater kayaking, snowshoe camping, wilderness survival, rock climbing, inter intermediate rock climbing, uh, intermediate moguls. Had eight majors in two years. And finally, I decided maybe this college thing isn't working. Because that certainly didn't sound like the uh, architecture. So <clears throat> I got out of the University of Utah. I dropped out of the University of Utah. My parents were super proud. Um, Turns out, though, there's another path available in 1997-ish. It was Microsoft Certified Systems Engineer. I decided to get professional certifications because you need tickets. If you don't have a track record, you need tickets. So I'm going to say he knows how to do the thing that he says he knows how to do. So I got an MCSE. There are a bunch of tests you have to take. The first one is called Networking Essentials. Failed that one six times, like a boss. So close every time. Got through it, and good thing I did because I had to fix this Y2K thing. And the, the, the punchline is the only reason I got hired as a 20 year old to fix Y2K is because I had that MCSE. Like, you didn't interview well, and <laughs> you didn't really you know, sound like you know what you're talking about, but you have this paper, and we're desperate. I'm like, ah, sounds like dating in high school. That's fantastic. <laughs> the, Organization was called First Security Bank out of Utah, now absorbed into the giant monolith of Wells Fargo. Um, I take full credit. Well, let me rephrase that. I take as much credit as I deserve for saving you all from Y2K. That's a very subjective statement. All of that. Moved from Utah down to South Kakalaki. Worked for Royal Dutch Awful. Any awful people? No? Any awful oh, got some? Right on. Um, are you guys now Del Hayes or awful Del Hay? You know what? Let's not talk about family matters. Um, I got involved with this product suite called Tivoli. It was amazing. We were, it was Tivoli versus CA, and we were doing things like software distribution. We were doing inventory. We were doing all kinds of stuff. It was so cool and so ultimately boring. Oh, I don't want to talk to a user whose computer is doing a thing. I want to do something cool. So I went to my manager. He's like, Benny, I'm super bored, man. Can I get something cool? And he's like, have you heard of this thing called security? It's a new thing. And we got to work on this thing called Tidly Access Manager. That's not the product I started working on. I cannot find a logo for that product on the internet. It's too old. It was policy director. It was before the days of LDAP. It was, it was fantastic. So we got to work on that. Um, I accidentally brought down all email for the company for about four hours. We don't want to talk about that. <clears throat> but you know, when you're handling username and passwords and databases for all people, maybe you should put an eyeball on the 22-year-old. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> so we did that for a while. And uh, in the, the great wisdom that corporate worlds will have sometimes, I decided, hey, we can save a lot of money if we outsource. And it works every time. I'm sure it does. I'm sure it did. So they outsourced it to EDS. All IT went to EDS, of which then became HP. And I went to my uh, director, went to my boss, and I said, hey, Paul, I'm super excited for this new opportunity. Whole new company, whole new place to swim. Um, what's my career path? And he said, you got none. Go talk to EDS. I said, oh, sweet. How about a letter of recommendation instead? He said, sure. Boom, I jumped to IBM. 
I worked for IBM for three glorious years as a road warrior. I hit over 35 Fortune uh, 500 companies in three years. It was a whirlwind of activity. This is where I really learned what it meant to communicate effectively to executives to try to get cybersecurity initiatives forward and through the pipeline because up to this point, I had been clickety-click on a mouse, typey-type on a keyboard, not a whole lot of speakety-speak from the mouth. I made that right up. Right now, I like it. I'm going to use that next time. Speaky speak. You can use it in your talk. So, I also had an experience where I had a beautiful golden retriever named Montana who um, kept peeing on my side of the bed because I was never home. And if your golden retriever is managing, you're on the road too much. <laughs> so, I left IBM after an 18 hour layover in Montgomery, Alabama. If you've ever been to that airport, bless you. It'll make anyone want to change their life. And it did. So I did that and went right back to uh, consulting with Awful. And I'm like, oh, I'm doing it. And then they kept asking for more. And they asked for more. And they asked for more. And eventually we grew to over 3 million in revenue and 25 employees. And I fired myself because I'm brave enough to do that. Then I began doing a bunch of TED Talks and talking to people. It was great. And I was thinking and I was doing. And I thought I was really good because my first cybersecurity company worked. I should totally do a second one. Boom! That one failed. That was only 650000 of my own dollars lit on fire in a dumpster fire. <laughs> See that nice shirt right there? Dumpster fire shirt. That's the image I wanted to go for. Um, so I got sad and I sold the other company. And then I really just got tired of technology and I got really excited about people. And so I wanted to explore the behavioral science behind cybersecurity. So that's where Hook Security comes from. That's a behavioral security company where we are trying to uh, help the user behind the keyboard not lower the drawbridge on the cyber fortress. Also, what? Cyber masterminds. Turns out a big part of what we are doing in our jobs is not being addressed. We're going to dive into that. So this is a super complex slide. And I'm very proud of myself for it going better than I thought it was going to go. That was a clap line. Feel free to applause. <laughs> Stop it. Stop it. So here are the three tracks of cybersecurity from Adam's opinion. We got tech, we got executive, and we got entrepreneur. The tech track. The tech track is made up of different levels. The first one is you get technical mastery of a thing. Something in cybersecurity you have mastery over. I don't care what it is. So maybe you're great at firewalls, maybe you're great at pen tests, maybe you're great at Visio. Whatever you decide to do. Actually, Visio is definitely management. Um, that was, I thought that was going to go over better. That's cool. Second, you have to have the ability to understand the problem facing the organization. Because too often, if you don't understand the problem, you can't really come up with a solution. The last, you actually have to be able to talk to people and know the direction the organization is going, so you make the right decision. We were talking earlier about, hey, do you take the, Doug said something about the, the, the server need to be taken down, because it's been breached earlier in this keynote. And the manager was like, don't take it down, it's making us money. And all of us were like, that's dumb. Was it? I mean, if it's making a million dollars an hour, and we're worried about a breach that's going to cost us $100,000, hmm, spreadsheet looks pretty clear to me. So knowing the direction and what the thing is supposed to do is what you really need to know if you're a technical guy or gal to actually do your job well. All right? Here are the roles that I have made up that are awesome. Army one, master and commander, and the diplomat. These are the different levels. As, as you get better and better at each one of these three things I just talked about, you get to do more and more. Army one, people come to you to fix things. You are a master at your crap. I absolutely trust you. You can fix the thing. However, I do not trust you to actually think about the bigger picture, so I never bring you all the data you need to see the bigger picture. You are a technician who is required to do a thing, and nobody talks to you about what you actually know or know how to do. It's kind of sad, but you, just, you do get paid, right? You do get paid to fix the thing. Second here is, hey, you actually have some social skills. You're able to ask better questions. And because you're asking better questions, they trust you more. You're still doing some cool tech stuff, but you're also involved in a lot of the uh, important conversations. You find that the better you get on this, the less surprises you have. 
on a Friday afternoon, right? Then you get to the ultimate level. You are brought into the most complicated problems ahead of time. Hey, we're thinking about doing a thing. Can you come and share what you know? You have to have such a great level of trust between you, a technical expert, and the line of business that they value you that way, right? So let's, oh, can you crush it like all the time? Yep, thought that was going to go back to you. <laughs> so the more you do, the more money you can pay. And as you see, it's the more you're able to interact with the business in a trusted way, the more you get paid. I'm sure nobody in this room has experienced this, where you look at somebody else who's not as good at the technical thing you're a mastery at, and they keep making more money and getting promotions, but don't you understand? I'm the expert! Turns out, if you're an expert, but you can't convey that expertise in a way somebody else can absorb, or you don't listen long enough to find out what they need for you to do and actually do it, you're not very valuable to the organization. And this is about value, and this is about getting paid. So, social skills. Let's move on to the executive track. By the way, punchline to all this is social skills. You can leave now if you figure that's enough, but I would prefer it you stay. All right, executive track. Lots of bullet points for this guy. Understands where security fits into the bigger picture. Can build teams, can build and manage processes, can build and manage systems. And those aren't systems like JD clack clack. These are like how different organizational systems work together. Uh, can interact with other people in the organization to develop long-term strategies and lead people. I heard a pretty cool definition of leadership from President Santos of Colombia, winner of the 2018 Nobel Peace Prize while I was on Necker Island hanging out with Richard Branson. Name drop! <laughs> <laughs> he said leadership is the skill of progressing people your people into change at a pace they can stand, right? Change is difficult, change is hard. Leadership is about saying, I know what perfect looks like, you're right here, we have a journey to do, and I'm not gonna demand you reach it right now. So a ex world-class executive understands that and can pace themselves appropriately. There are different kinds of executive roles. Again, defined by yours truly. Track and vote captain. Overwatch and strategic command. So the dragon boat captain is the dude who is the drummer. See him? And he's yelling at people, all right, we're going to do this thing. You guys are the employees. You're the technical masters. I've got to make sure you have everything you need to do your job. If you are working on computers, you probably need a keyboard. I'll make you have one, right? If you're going to be paddling, you've got to have these paddles. And we've got to make sure we're all doing it at the same time. And so the dragon boat captain is your first line manager, and your manager is there to make sure that you are all heading in the same direction, that you have everything you need to get your job done, and you have the support you need. And also to make sure that the process is functioning. Because look at this guy. We're going to call him Billy. Everyone has a Billy in your organization. Um, what is he doing? Pay attention. Pick your head up, Billy. Everyone else has to paddle up like this. He's like this. If Billy had the, uh, the freedom, he'd probably be paddling the wrong way. But he's a fantastic paddler. But he's useless to me in this organization. Man, he's great at paddling. I don't care, Billy. What are you doing? The boat, that way, right? By the way, if you don't think you have a Billy in your organization, you, are you might be Billy. <laughs> yeah, right. you might be Billy. You might be him. There's only one guy. <laughs> Overwatch. So the manager is making sure the employees have what they need. And they're all working together, and it's a support role. Then you go to a director level. The director level is trying to make sure that all of these things are working together. Um, they get the data to make sure that multiple teams are all going in the same direction. So think of it more like an admiral. They're all focused on getting stuff done. So they're doing a lot of audits. Maybe those aren't the right paddles. We're really paddling hard. They're doing a great job, but we're not moving so fast. Let's change the paddle. Hey, you know, if we change the process and the beat of the drum, maybe we can get on the page the same way. So, the manager is making sure you're executing the processes as desired. The director is taking the data up from those processes and making sure those processes are the right thing to do. And if they're intelligent, we hope they are, they're talking to the guys holding the paddles, right? Because they're closest to the problem, they have the best information. But not Billy. Really. Then you have strategic command. These guys are really plugged in to the direction of the company, and they make sure the systems that the processes funnel into are the right systems. 
These people own the results. These people have to look at all the things, and they're the ones held accountable. These are your VPs and your presidents of companies that if they do not produce the desired result, they get fired. It's very short-lived life. You're either crushing it and getting big bonuses, or you're out in one or two years, right? Turns out, it's the same pattern. Your manager makes some pretty good money and they are in charge of executioning of processes. The director makes better money and is in charge of making sure these are the right processes to be doing and that they're actually functioning correctly. And then the senior level executive is responsible for results. And the tools that they use for those results are data and people. They are so far away from the actual process because they have to have such a big picture. You know, it's a kind of risky job because, again, they're held, inside, uh, held accountable for those processes producing results. And if someone is trying to break in that door, if somebody comes through that door and comes at me, you got them? All right, thanks, Rob. <laughs> Don't worry, I will run. That's okay. <laughs> people, processes, systems. That's the way to think about it. One manager is in charge of people, one is in charge of processes, one in charge of systems. Hey, don't look at that yet. Okay, now look at it. <laughs> Let's talk about how you actually make money in this world. Uh, anybody ever read Rich Dad, Poor Dad, Cash Flow Quadrant? Again, don't ruin my presentation. Just keep your mouth shut. This is going to be great. If less of you are wrong, feel free to raise your hand and say, I don't know. You're going to make money as an employee, self employed, business owner, or investor. The way you do that, is this is not about money, this is about time. An employee trades their time for money. And the more valuable that time is to somebody else, the more money they're gonna pay you. So if you're in the, the, the game of, I am a cybersecurity technician, and the stuff I do is valued at a particular thing, it's really important for you to get the best certifications possible, to be up at the top of your game, to work on the best problems, because that makes your time super valuable. Right? Same equation for self-employed, Except now you're assuming more of the risk because you're not an employee, you're self-employed. So because you assume more risk, you get more money. Business owner builds systems and then trades other people's time for money. And I gotta tell you, it's a great place to live, guys. You should try it if you haven't already. It's all right. And then here's something I still haven't figured out. How do you trade money for money? And I mean, this ain't that hot, all right? So, I want to talk a little bit about the entrepreneur track. We've got the um, technology track, which is mastery of something, and then more and more progression towards asking good questions and hearing good answers and being able to get on page with direction. You've got executive track, building up the people, building up the processes, and building up the systems. Now, we're doing entrepreneur. To me, entrepreneur is when you see a problem in the systems. So, Entrepreneurs observe things and they look for friction points, right? And they say, huh, that could be done different. That could be done better. And the differentiation is they come and say, I should do that. I'm not going to wait for somebody else to do that. Talk about um, initiative this morning, a Seth Godin quote. Absolutely right. You stand up and say, I'm going to fix that. You then are so confident in what you are doing, you create what we call a reality distortion field. And you con other people into believing your amazing vision is going to happen too. And these fools come and work for you. What's up, Brad? <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, hook security, wrap out in the front row. Reality distortion, I got you. <laughs> and now we connect these ideas in ways that other people haven't seen before. We do it in such a way that is executed that it's sustainable, right? Because we don't want to fix the idea once for one person. We want to put something in place that expands and expands and expands and sticks around. And the last thing is entrepreneurs typically process risk different. When I was told I didn't have a career path at awful and I would have to go and talk to EDS, the riskiest thing to me was, oh, I just figured it out. I'm a line item on a spreadsheet that some CFO is going to look at, and if my number's too big and he's trying to reduce cost, he will have zero care of what I actually do 
I'm gone. To me, working for a big company was risky. To me, owning the behaviors that results in me being successful and beating my family, that's what I was gonna do. So entrepreneurs typically process risk differently, which is why it's super important to have a financial advisor because you lose your money all the time. It's not that funny, it hurts probably. It's not good. So I do a whole like workshop on these next two slides I'm gonna just go through. There are four stages of entrepreneurship. Business is happening to you, meaning you had to do something. You saw the problem, you made it happen, you bonus your shit. Typically, you're a solopreneur at this point, you're just doing a thing. Then, business is happening by you. You've taken a step back, kind of moved into that manager role, now you have people doing the things and you're helping support them. Then, business is happening through you. You're no longer touching the processes. You're sitting back making deep thoughts. Life is happening, you may not get a whole lot of emails, and then finally business is happening for you, and your company has a CEO over it, and you're just kind of wandering around giving TED Talks. I think that's pretty fantastic, but it doesn't get like the motion. So there is this fantastic business consultant that I have been following for a couple of years, actually since the 90s. I uh, suggest you um, add this guy to your feed. Um, his name is uh, Eric Cartman from Software. <laughs> and he covers the same four, Processes, same four steps. You gotta start up, catch and sell out, and then grow down. Okay? We are gonna be talking about startup. I'm going to assume you do not have the thing happening, and if you already do, talk to me later, we can we can work on that. But you're gonna follow Eric Cartman if you're gonna start up. <clears throat> Step one. You wanna know how to start a cybersecurity business? For the love of God, people, read my book. Anybody? <laughs> Come on. Oh. Yeah, that's kind of ended. <clears throat> Let's see if the slides are going to go better. They do! Okay. Read my book. <laughs> Find a problem that needs to be solved. And this could be tech track or exec track. Everybody here could probably take five minutes and write down things that makes them frustrated about how their job is done. Those are a great place to start, but it's not a place to end. Because does anyone care about it? I've I solved the problem that no one else has but me. That's not a business. That's like a hobby, right? So there's three things to know. If your problem that you solve is actually going to have the ability to turn into a business, somebody who has that same pain, who has the authority to make a decision and has budget, gives you money to do it. Doesn't have to be a lot of money, just some money. And if they give you money to fix your problem, they love what you've done enough to tell their friends. Because if you fix it once and no one cared enough to tell anybody about it, it's not an important enough problem you should go back to the dashboard and keep looking. Right? And then you gotta figure out how to actually talk to those other people and get them to also give you money to see if they care enough to do it. Because remember, the goal of any entrepreneurial activity is not necessarily to make more money, it's just solve a problem, and the money is the fuel that you put in the rocket to make the thing go, because money is a horrible goal. It does not make you happy. It is not a thing that you should do. Your goal should be, this is the change I want to see in the world, and I need this kind of money to make sure that change never goes away. That's the whole secret here. But you can buy a boat, and it's all right. Really? Come on, I can't. That's it? All right. <clears throat> so you make more money than it takes to cost the you make more money than it costs to solve the problem, you take care of yourself and your family, and you run the company. That's sustainable. That's sustainable. I've tried this a few times. I thought it was super good, because my first one, I found out a security group. Bam! Totally worked. Totally worked. I must be good. Ooh. I did that one, that one sucked. Uh, I've had 14, uh, I had a couple other ones that were just asking about my homebrew company, asking about that knife company, based off of the rock and roll guy, and we got the dude who did Lord of the Rings weapons to build the knives and almost ordered 60,000 from China. It's, it's a thing. Make sure you find out budget paying authority, because if you don't have a buyer, you don't got a company. Here's the swan song, guys. This one right here is working. This one is awesome. I've got the right people, got the right things, got the right problem. And now we're gonna talk a little bit about the jewel. Cyber masterminds, how are you guys gonna make more money? You're already technical masters. Everybody in here has got a level of skill set that's gonna get you through a door. Everyone in here is pretty, pretty awesome at a thing, right? But we've figured out though, being awesome at a thing isn't good enough. You gotta be able to communicate 
you got to do the thing, you got to talk to people. And that's the whole idea of cyber masterminds. <coughs> so the problem, if every trap caps you, if you don't have personal skills or the ability to ask these questions, you have these answers. And it's pretty easy to find tech training. There's a lot of really good tech training out there. But there's not a whole lot of how do I help cybersecurity professionals build the skill sets to ask questions and to listen to answers in a corporate environment or a complex organization? Well, there wasn't one. <laughs> Thank you for the polite laugh. Thank you very much. So what I keep bumping into though is I use the word mastermind so people are like, what's the mastermind? What's the mastermind? I'm like, all right, it's not this guy, right? <laughs> It's not this guy. Though I would totally mastermind with that guy. I think that'd be fun. What it is, is it's a model that I'm stealing from CEOs. CEOs get ahead by cheating. They all get together and they talk to each other, right? And they share problems with their group and they get feedback, but they don't get, get feedback on their problem. They hear everyone else's problem and in that one session have an accelerated rate of learning. They came with one problem, but heard everyone else's problem, and now leave with eight times the knowledge. This results in fast learning, and you absolutely need this. Right? So if you're on who build these skill sets, you can't read a book or watch a video. You have to literally talk to human beings and practice. And if they can use this tool, so can we. Because this is the secret. This is how executives make money. This is how we're also going to improve so we can make money too. Now let's look at this picture. You thought it would be happy. No, it's sad, you know why? That's a rhetorical question, feeling it for you not to answer. They're sad because they had to sit there and they're waiting for you and you're not there because you're too smart to show up to a conference room. We have this thing called the internet. Let's just do this online. And let's not make it eight hours, let's keep it to just an hour. Let me walk you through it. Here we go. That's happy, that's online, that's Zoom. Right, check it out. Yeah, my side, yeah. Look, I took the first one I found on my Google, okay? Boom, that. Wait, I took the first conference call that had happy people in it when I Googled, right? There was a long list of just... Hey, Shane. So, if you uh, train your own damn self, take responsibility for yourself, and you're gonna do this with new friends. So, picture this, small groups get together for one hour every other week on a Zoom call. It's easy, you like click and you show up and you talk. But what are you gonna do? How's this look? Well, every member takes a turn being in the hot seat. Each one takes a turn and goes. They bring a problem every 20 minutes. Somebody solves that problem with you and everybody gets to practice asking questions about that problem. The goal here is not to solve the problem. It's cool if it's solved. The goal is to have the other people on the call practice asking better questions listening to your response and coming up with solutions. Remember that technical trap? In order to move up to the monies, you have to be able to sit in a meeting where a business person is talking and ask them questions about their problem in a way that builds trust and proves that you understand what's going on so they can trust you back. Other members practice the thing I just said. Everyone slowly gets better at listening, asking questions, and making suggestions, right? I don't know about you, but I'm super smart. <clears throat> and sometimes I hear someone with a problem, and maybe once or twice, I don't let them finish talking before I'm already telling them the solution. It's just me, you guys are emotionally intelligent, self-aware human beings, and I appreciate you letting me share my weakness. But if you do have that, <clears throat> you might wanna consider. So this leads to unlock or higher paying jobs in tech and exec, as well as prep for entrepreneurship, if that's where you happen to wanna go. And by the way, I don't think any one of these things are better. If you wanna make a lot of money, one of the best ways is to be a fantastic technical person who is trusted by executives. And some of the highest paid people on the planet are employees. Do not confuse any of these tracks with this is the path to lower, the higher money. The chances are that as you reach a higher level, you're going to be doing a little bit of all three of these. You're gonna do a little bit of internal entrepreneurship, but you're not gonna go out on your own. You're gonna be a bit of an executive, taking responsibility for your results, and you're also going to be a 
technical expert is going to be able to apply what you know about cybersecurity to the overall organization. We call that having mastery of your craft, autonomy and being able to make your own decisions, and purpose, knowing where you should go in the organization, where the organization is going, and how to align your activities. <coughs> you guys want to see some pictures? Ooh, ooh, ooh. Look at those guys. So, three tracks, three super attractive men. <laughs> Subjectively. Uh, yeah. So, the idea here is how do we get better at all these conversations? How do we get better at actually practicing this stuff? And I'm going to see if I have a real problem. This is going to be a sales pitch. You guys ready? Don't be afraid. It's going to be okay. I want a dollar bill. I want to prove that we're actually solving a problem that anyone cares about by you guys getting a dollar bill sometime in the next 12 months. I want you to go to cybermasterminds.com and subscribe so that we can introduce you to this concept of masterminds and find people to help you get better at all of these things that are going to unlock money. Because if you walk out of here with these lessons today, you're going to practice talking and asking questions, and then about two or three months later, you're going to stop and you're going to be back into where you are. This is a continuous thing that has to be practiced over and over again in a safe place with people who you trust, and those are other IT cybersecurity professionals. The reason it's $1, because Brad's paying for it. Thank you, Brad. Brad's picking up the cost for everything else. This one of security is sponsoring this new thing because it's super important. Cyber, the number one cybersecurity risk facing the nation is the nerd's inability to write a business case the CFO will fund. This is going to fix that. This is going to be able to talk to business people after you're done with this. So, we're going to go to some networking events. I want you to come and find one of these three people and practice your emotional intelligence on them. Ask them questions. Better yet, Tim, would you raise your hand? He's going to have to use the bathroom once. See him on the way to the bathroom. Stop him on his way to the bathroom and enter into a conversation. And watch him smart. I'll be like, super fly. <laughs> oh, that's fascinating. Tell me more about that product. But I really, I mean, and when he walks away from you, follow him into the bathroom. <laughs> Keep talking as he's at the urn. Be welcome. All right, we're almost done, guys. Next steps. Go to cybermasterminds.com and subscribe. I swear. This is going to be the best thing you've done for your career. It is the best thing I've ever done for my career. I've been a mastermind for over 10 years. I am not that great at a lot of stuff, but I surround myself with people who are better and see things differently, and I get to use their wisdom and not just me. You, can't get, you cannot defeat me. I've got 10 guys, 10 gals, 10 people all around me just pushing me forward, and no one lets me fail, and that's what you're signing up for, a community that is going to support you. And apparently, that blue thing coming out of my mouth that was not supposed to be there until later. <laughs> Connect with me on LinkedIn. Tell me what a great job I did. <laughs> buy my damn books, maybe now you're not gonna buy my books. No, I bought my wife published a book, In Bed with the Business, The Entrepreneurial Spouse's Survival Guide. And day one, I sold all of my books. <laughs> I guess this is a hobby. I'm finding pain that no one wants to pay for, and that's okay. It's fun for me. Come find me at the networking event. Test out your emotional intelligence. Connect with me on LinkedIn. Hit these websites. And if anyone has any questions, I would love to hear them. If not, this is an appropriate time for a standing ovation or a rousing round of applause. Yeah.